Hello. How are you? I mean, for real. Well, we've opened up the chat and we'd love to know how you are. Please tell us. <laughs> well, what a week. I'm glad you're all here. Today, together, we consider what is resilience. When Anne-Marie Burke, my collaborative partner in 10 Questions and I thought about the sequences this fall, we deliberately asked what is hope directly before election day and followed up with what is resilience today. Merriam-Webster defines resilience as the capacity to recover. Needless to say, recovery cannot be accomplished by an election alone. There is much work to be done. How do we address this ever worsening pandemic, an ailing economy, systemic racism, a massive sociopolitical divide and a climate crisis that millions still refuse to acknowledge. Regardless of your political affiliation, we have passed a threshold and we, the people, through our actions, have reassured the resilience of democracy itself. So now it's time to take a deep breath and continue. Resilience is often a response to pressure, a form of resistance to hostile environments, an insistence on recovery and continuation. In this sense, as a choreographer, I see resilience as a duet, a partnered response. It's relational, for example, our body's capacity to respond to disease, the body adapting to its environment in order to move toward well being. Consider emotional resilience in relationship to external challenges and trauma. Consider how quickly we have reformulated daily experience in response to COVID 19. And consider communal resilience in response to external violence and threat. And while the list goes on, consider the Earth's own resilience in response to human degradation of the environment. Consider, if you will, resilience in the form of scorched earth from which flora of the native landscape reemerges after a wildfire. Consider Resilience in music that lifts you up, that lifts a generation up. Consider those who dance in the streets as at protests as a form of resistance and an embodiment of resilience. Resilience, whether innate or chosen, is a commitment to overcoming. But I wonder, are there circumstances, circumstances in which the expectation of resilience is actually a form of oppression? Art making is a form of resilience. The ways in which artists respond to life, finding refuge, celebrate, celebrating, mourning, reminding, creating balance, telling stories, asking questions. Speaking of art, I'd like to share a poem called A Portable Paradise by Roger Robinson, a British writer of Trinidadian descent 
who won the T.S. Eliot Prize just this year. And if I speak of paradise, then I'm speaking of my grandmother who told me to carry it always on my person, concealed, so no one else would know but me. That way, they can't steal it, she'd say. And if life puts you under pressure, trace its ridges in your pocket, smell its piney scent on your handkerchief, hum its anthem under your breath. And if your stresses are sustained and daily, get yourself to an empty room, be it hotel, hostel, or hovel. Find a lamp and empty your paradise onto a desk, your white sands, green hills, and fresh fish. Shine the lamp on it like the fresh hope of morning and keep staring at it till you sleep. For those who are joining for the first time, 10 Questions is a course offered by UCLA School of the Arts and Architecture and simultaneously a public platform for thoughtful engagement with our extended community. We're here together because of our shared resourcefulness, resilience, and extraordinary adaptability. And it's here with you that 10 Questions brings together the treasured resources of the university, our teachers, our students, and our community to build capacity in this time of urgent need and great precarity. The format for this evening, like our other evenings, will include a 10 minute presentation from each of our panelists, followed by conversation amongst them. Our students will then immediately gather in small group discussions in Zoom breakout rooms, and everyone else will remain here in the webinar for a very special presentation by students from Venice High School who have created their own photographic responses to tonight's question. We'll then welcome our students back and finish out the evening in a Q&A with our esteemed guests. So, our first panelist tonight is Tracy Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a professor of molecular cell and developmental biology, holder of the Keith and Cecilia Terasaki Presidential Endowed Chair, and Dean of the Division of Life Sciences in the UCLA College. Her research focuses on understanding the mechanisms of gene regulation, particularly RNA splicing, chromatin modification, and the intersection between these reactions. Recognized for her scientific leadership and contributions to educational innovation, and as a champion of diversity, equity, inclusion, she is co-director, co-principal investigator for a National Institutes of Health funded program that supports doctoral researchers, postdoctoral researchers preparing for academic careers. She started the UCLA Pathways to Success program, which is funded through the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to support the success of students from diverse backgrounds in STEM fields and is the principal investigator for a second Howard Hughes Medical Institute grant aimed at promoting greater access and success for students studying life sciences who transfer from community colleges. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. So I'd let me please start by thanking you for the opportunity to be in this conversation. It is really an honor. Um, and as you heard, I'm a biologist. And so I thought I'd start with a definition of resilience from the perspective of biology. It's the capacity of a system to absorb disturbances or perturbances and re reorganize so as to recover and retain function structure and patterns. 
And so what I'm interested in thinking about today is uh, this evening is from the perspective of biology, what does resilience mean? And I'm gonna look at it from the macro level of the envir environment ecosystems down to the micro level of cells that make up the body and the genes that drive their function. And then think about it in a slightly different way about the practice of science and who does science. And my take home message for all three is really going to be the following, that resilience is not a luxury. Our very survival in fact is dependent on understanding what makes biological systems resilient. So we're obviously living, as you, as we've alluded to, in really critical times when life on Earth as we know it really hangs in a balance largely because of human activity. And it's critical then that we really understand what makes ecosystems robust or resilient and what are the impacts that can push those ecosystems to irreversible, um, fragile territory. And I think there's a wonderful example of, of, of what describes an ecosystem as being resilient that can be illustrated um, in an example from 1883, the volcano Krakatoa in Indonesia. So on August, uh, August 26, 1883, there was a massive eruption um, that, uh, of, of Krakatoa. And just to understand how catastrophic that eruption was, um, this, uh, where in the location where the eruption took place, it completely sterilized the region around it. Life was completely decimated um, in a region as far as 85 kilometers away. And in fact, um, the tsunami that resulted from it led to the death of about 36,000 people. This is a picture of a boat that was found um, two miles inland because of the tsunami. So in addition to that, the ash from the um, uh, Krakatoa um, had dramatic effects on the, um, on the global atmosphere. So it circled the globe for several years, creating spectacular sunsets all around the world, including this inspiration back of the background of, of Edvard Munch's um, painting, The Screen. Um, and the global temperatures dropped about 1.2 centimeters because of the ash. And yet, and yet, as described from really a beautiful paper from one of my colleagues, Paul Barber, um, who analyzed the biodiversity in the region uh, that where the uh, volcano eruption uh, took place. And he found, or his group found, that the biodiversity in the coral ecosystems in that vicinity were the same in, as the biodiversity in undisturbed populations throughout Indo-Pacific. And this is work that was done in the late 80s, uh, late 90s. And in fact, on the right are pictures of the, uh, above the ground on the remnants of Krakatoa, and this is a recent picture of a Krakatoa tour um, in the, of the coral reefs. And so it really raises the question, what is it that makes an ecosystem resilient? And in this case, and what this um, work uh, demonstrated was that a proximity of a healthy environment that could really seed recovery was one key. And the second is the diversity within that environment because there was colonization of the coral environment through waves of um, waves and cycles of repopulation of organisms. And so I find this both comforting and exciting, meaning that ecosystems have the capacity to recover. But the question is, what is it that we can do that's different about the way we're approaching the questions of, of resilience of ecosystems that have to be different? First, the frequency and the persistence of the assault is a key component of the ability of an ecosystem to be resilient. Uh, while recovery from this single volcanic eruption was possible, really thinking about the persistence effects of, of human activity, um, and also the real need for protected spaces to repopulate um, the uh, in vicinity of potential perturbations. Um, and key is the diversity within those ecosystems. And so one of the lessons I think that is also um, given by the example of Krakatoa is that time scales matter. And so an ecosystem may be able to recover, but the question is, will the recovery happen within a time frame that is relevant for each of us? And I think we'll come back to that uh, in a bit. While recovery is possible, um, can we intercede quickly enough to ensure that we reap the benefits of that recovery? I'd like to shift now to thinking about um, another aspect of uh, biological resilience, and, and that's really at the cellular level. And there are three key components that um, are, are key for cellular resi resilience. Um, that is redundancy, adaptation, 
and dynamics. And I'll show you what I mean. So here's an example. For instance, these are normal cells. Um, and these cells have nuclei. And in the nuclei are the genetic information. And that's, those are genes that get turned on and turned off in order to allow the cell to perform proper function. So one thing that we often don't think about is that cells are really exposed to a lot of different perturbations and in some cases, um, um, really deleterious effects like UV light, radiation, chemicals. Um, and the, all of those could create a possibility of damage of the DNA. And as one can imagine, the instructions for the cell being damaged is not a good thing. But what's beautiful about the cellular mechanisms is that there are DNA damage responses that are redundant and repair mechanisms that, um, that ensure that DNA can be repaired and the um, and that damage does not lead to um, deleterious effects on cells. And even if there is a disruption in one of these responses, um, the redundancies ensure that there are a number of other backup strategies. And the adaptation um, is evident because in many cases, if there is a disruption of one activity, there'll be upregulation of another molecular pathway to ensure that the response is intact. The importance of this redundancy and, um, is, is really evident by the fact of thinking about what happens when things go wrong, when there are multiple assaults on these pathways. And this is an example of when those systems go awry. So the importance of redundancy and adaptation for cellular function and, re and resilience, I think is really illustrated by this response. Um, secondly, I'd like to, or thirdly, I'd like to um, give an example that uh, illustrates really the importance of dynamics. And so this is, um, I think, illustrated beautifully by the immune system. And um, 100 billion white blood cells, which are critical components of the, of the immune system, are produced and die each day. So this is the dynamics that I was referring to. Um, and a lot of times scientists can kind of get distracted by the idea that there's, you know, that it's uh, wasteful or it's a loss of energy. Or, But what's really clear is that dynamics are really much more important in this case than the conservation of energy, and here is why. Because if a cell encounters a pathogen, I should say these white blood cells, if there's a bacteria, they will gobble up the bacteria and then they'll basically commit suicide, right? So it clears the, um, clears the infectious agent. Um, but if the pathogen, if there is a pathogen that um, is exposed, to, these cells are exposed to, it doesn't wipe out the entire population of immune cells because they can reproduce. And so those dynamics are absolutely critical for the resilience of the system. And in addition to the dynamics, there's also the ability to adapt. And so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but there's also in this um, diverse population of cells, there's a type of cell that responds and recognizes a pathogen and will increase white blood cell production. And as those white blood cells um, self-destruct, then the, those same cells can recognize and help to modulate and pre create a negative feedback loop to constantly maintain this balance of, of blood cells. So the system is incredibly resilient because of the ability for these um, activities to be dynamic and to be adaptive. And so in thinking about the, from the cellular level, the, um, the redundancy, the dynamics and the ability to adapt ensures um, the proper uh, cellular function and uh, gene expression, um, gene expression pathways. So this going back to uh, the role of resilience in biology, we could see it from the large um, macro level of ecosystems in the environment to the micro level of cells and genes. And really the take home message for both is that our very survival is dependent um, not only on resilience, but also on understanding what makes uh, biological systems resilient. So how do we figure all of this out, right? Science. But science, you know, science can be tricky, right? Science can be difficult. And, and this is something we think about a lot here at UCLA, where we have one of the, um, you know, top um, biology and science departments, we think about what it is that we're doing when we, when we train um, our young scientists, our students. 
But science can be difficult because it's challenging to know what questions to ask. Sometimes the questions are really hard to answer and sometimes it's really difficult to design the right experiments. And in fact, I love this quote from Soshiro Honda who um, describes, I think very aptly, what many scientists discover is that success is about 99% failure. The act of, of, of the iterative act of doing science uh, requires absolutely resilience. And in fact, it requires an extraordinary level of resilience. And so while we teach the nuts and bolts of many of the topics here at UCLA, one of the questions is how can we help to imbue resilience into um, the curriculum as well? And what I found in my own teaching um, is that many of the students who are the best scientists have had to navigate some real challenges. They've had lived experiences of resilience that make them particularly well-equipped to pursue science. And so the diversity of the voices of who does science um, becomes absolutely critical. Why? Because it affects the questions we ask, it, it affects the approaches that are taken and the way we interpret data. So who does science affects every aspect of science. So just as in ecosystems or in cell biology, diversity and resilience go hand in hand. And so I'd just like to leave you, uh, leave you with a thought. So one of the questions that you know, we really grapple with in the scientific community is that given how important it is to have diversity of voices and approaches, how can we foster a vibrant psycho, uh, uh, science ecosystem, you know, for example, shown here, where it's resilient and maximally functional and taking advantage of diversity, um, compared to, for instance, an example like this, where it's clear that there's not a maximal optimization of the potential diversity in the environment. And so you might ask yourself, you know, what is, what is, what is happening? What is wrong in, on the right-hand side or what is not uh, optimal on the right-hand side? You know, one question is, you know, what's wrong with the fish? What's wrong with those individuals in the environment? But probably a better qu question is, you know, what's, what's in the water? And so this is a question like so many um, now are really reckoning with, the same kind of reckoning is happening in science, which is what is the culture of science? What is the ecosystem and how can it optimally support diversity and the, the strength of the scientific endeavor? Um, so uh, I'd like to just end with this take home message. I think we're really at an amazing moment in our history when understanding resilience of biological systems um, and you know, from the macro to the micro level is literally a matter of life and death. Um, and we really do, uh, we're at this moment where we can begin to think about how to attract a diverse and resilient group of folks who are ready to ask and answer these fundamental questions. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I feel as though you've framed this up for us in such a great way to see how resilience is embedded literally and figuratively in uh, the survival of our ecosystems in our body in all life and including in, um, in the field of science, the importance of diverse viewpoints and the perspectives of individuals who have had to look at systems themselves. So um, we're gonna go on, but excited to come back and talk more with you. Um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Kian Gall. Kian is an assistant professor of urban planning at UCLA Luskin. She researches the relationships between urban ecological design, spatial politics and social mobilization in the context of climate change and global urbanization. More broadly, her research interests include urban theory, urban design, environmental planning, and urban political ecology. As a professional architect, she co-founded the design firm, Super Interesting, exclamation point. That's the name of the design firm, and which is super interesting. And, she has been practicing um, with other award-winning firms. So welcome, Kian. Thank you so much, Victoria. And such a pleasure and really a privilege and honor to be here tonight. Tracy, thank you. That was actually a fantastic opening to this. Uh, and I, yeah, I feel like I will just pick up on some of the things that, that you've intro there.
So you should see a, a slide up called what is resilience. So in my work as a, as a researcher of urban planning, urban studies and urban design, I researched the spatial politics of urban climate change responses. So I look at plans proposed by cities to protect and adapt to, to excuse me, to protect and adapt to climate impacts and also the social movements that are organized against unjust actions, which sometimes includes actually the plans that have been proposed for climate change. So in, a, in my forthcoming book, which is titled Form and Flow, The Spatial Politics of Urban Resilience and Climate Justice. I investigate sites and strategies in three cities, New York, Jakarta, and Rotterdam. And I follow the flows of ideas and influence among these three different cities. So in the work that I do, resilience has really emerged over the last 10 to 12 years or so to, to conceptualize the ability of a city or people in the city, groups of people or institutions and places to recover from increasing environmental or social and econ economic shocks and stresses. So oftentimes urban resilience, as we call it, actually borrows from concepts in ecology and psychology. So actually a lot of the, the, the concepts that Tracy was bringing up earlier. Resilience is held up as a positive characteristic of people and places to withstand the threats that they face, to bounce back, as it were, not only from climate change impacts, such as hurricanes and floods. And you see here uh, during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, a breach uh, flood levy, but also to bounce back from economic shocks, social strife, or even terrorist attacks. And so why wouldn't we want something like this? Why wouldn't we want people and places to recover from bad things? Well, there's been growing criticism against a kind of unquestioned invocation and conceptualization of resilience. So as lawyer and activist Tracy L. Washington here states in the wake of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, quote, stop calling me resilient because every time you say, oh, they're resilient, that means you can do something else to me. I am not resilient, end quote. So activists and scholars have challenged the ways in which resilience is often used by those in power to divest themselves from their own responsibilities or to legitimize the impacts on already marginalized people. They have also challenged the vagueness of the term where it can mean so many things and taken issue with the ways in which resilience is often used to promote and protect status quo socioeconomic systems. So bounce back, but bounce back to what? The kinds of things that got us into this trouble in the first place often. So in my work, I, you know, I take to heart these criticisms of resilience. And yet I've seen so many examples amongst marginalized communities with whom I've worked as a scholar, as an architect, and as a community member and an activist. I've seen these really profound and empowering actions of resilience. And I'm really interested to see how we might conceive of a kind of more just notion of resilience. Can that notion of resilience be developed and practiced from within the marginalized communities that are most threatened from climate impacts? So I want to challenge really these dominant mainstream views of resilience as a kind of universal idea of people and places and cities. And also maybe a more, you know, the, the reductive critical views that dismiss resilience as, as a concept, uh, as a concept that may offer some lessons for us who are looking for more just futures. So I'll show this by telling a short story about one neighborhood in New York City, one in which I've been working in 
and thinking about for more than a decade now. Hurricane Sandy hit the New York region in October 2012. It brought unprecedented destruction to the urban region and really made folks aware of the sheer vulnerability of the urban region. Um, and here you see the cover from New York Magazine the month after Sandy, where the power to lower Manhattan to a third of Manhattan really had been knocked out by an explosion at a Con Edison plant around 23rd Street. When Sandy hit Red Hook, Brooklyn, which you see here, a coastal and low-lying neighborhood in southern Brooklyn, southwest Brooklyn, was among the worst hit neighborhoods. Red Hook is home to the Red Hook houses that you see in the background here, the largest New York City Housing Authority public housing project in Brooklyn. So primarily home to low income black and brown communities, but as well, not too far from here, a kind of hotbed of gentrification. So when Sandy hit, I was worried. I had worked with uh, a community group, community center called the Red Hook Initiative that works with largely uh, black and brown youth who live in the Red Hook houses, trying to break the cycles of intergenerational poverty in the neighborhood. And I'd help the Red Hook Initiative design a community center, their new home, which you see here, uh, basically catty corner adjacent to the Red Hook houses. But after the storm, the community center actually remained dry, even though the, the Red Hook houses just next door uh, was flooded. And in the days after, it actually became a kind of command and control center for storm recovery. So staff and volunteers set up a, a soup kitchen and they worked with agencies, including from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to set up a recovery center. FEMA officials uh, use Red Hook Wi-Fi which was a community mesh network to expand their own communications capabilities in the days after the storm when many communications infrastructures had been taken down. And staff from the Red Hook Initiative uh, sent out calls over social media asking for donations and more volunteers. And so this, the work of the Red Hook Initiative RHI here and their constituents seems like an, a, a great example of community resilience. And this, even in the face of continual systemic structural challenges. To this day, uh, well, actually, I believe it's under construction now. I haven't been able to go, get back to New York this year, but temporary boilers were put up right after the storm and they remained there for years. And folks in the, the Red Hook houses were just talking about constantly having to breathe in fumes from the temporary boilers. So what can we learn about Red Hook, about resilience? And I wanna share some quotes by Jill Eisenhardt, the founding executive director of RHI. And I think it's really important in cases like this to hear directly from those involved in the work. So on the social context uh, and shared history in Red Hook. So according to Jill Eisenhardt quote, so before October 29, 2012, we talked about resilience every day. And our definition of it was, life will inevitably knock you down and you need to be able to get up again. Resilience is being able to know that you have the strength or knowledge or self-belief or motivation or confidence within yourself to get up and try again. And that you also have a social network around you that is going to help you if you can't do it for yourself. So the individual is important and what we instilled in ourselves is important, but it's also the social network, 
folks that we can count on around us. On the need to organize and to build these relationships. So Jill says, quote, many of the people who were there during Sandy had worked at RHI for five years, eight years, 10 years. And so our whole model was around training people to be able to identify community need and respond to it. And sure, it's different from a young person who's suddenly homeless, but knowing who your neighbors are, knowing how to assess a situation and how to develop an action plan or an agenda. So that's important. Jill says, quote, you need to be able to recognize that the people from a community have the power to create their own change and investing in people, their social capital there. You have to create the social, excuse me, you have to create opportunities for people to take it, to, to take action ahead of time. And then one final point to quote Jill again, a lot of what we're responding to is directly related to the systems, forces, and circumstances that are true in this neighborhood. Here, everyone has the same experience with transportation or how long it takes to get somewhere. Everyone has the same experience with the fact that there's no public high school. Everyone has the same experience that all the open ball fields uh, are closed so that there's nowhere to go. So scholars who are critical about this idea, this dominant idea about resilience, bouncing back, they talk about the apolitical nature of that or the neglect of lived experiences or about community knowledge. And I agree with those critiques. I think that when we talk about resilience, we need to look at the positional and embodied circumstances of those that who, with whom we are working and with whom we're trying to understand what is resilience for them. So on the one hand, Resilience is positional against systemic power structures and against oppression. And on the other hand, it is also place-based, so literally grounded. Jill Eisenhardt from RHI talks about location, about shared experiences, about transportation or housing or food or struggles against unjust policing and how to build community against that. So, in a context of unjust, unequal urban development that we see all around us, including very much so in Los Angeles, resilience cannot be just about a universal good city, everything or everyone just bouncing back. It's about positional struggles against discriminatory systems, and it is grounded based on shared struggles in place. Thank you. Thank you, Kian. Um, I very much appreciate that you, you know, we had this wonderful introduction from Tracy and now thinking about the need to think very specifically and not generically about resilience and positionality. I um, think that um, this is very exciting and I look forward to talking about it some more. Um, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our third and final panelist, Dwayne Benjamin, otherwise known as Benjamin. Dwayne Benjamin is an accomplished performer, composer, orchestrator, and arranger. For over 40 years, he has made a successful living in the music industry, playing trombone, electric bass, performing and recording with top industry legends and everyday musicians alike, including jazz greats such as the Count Basie Orchestra, Stanley Clark, the Gerald Wilson Orchestra, and the Clayton Hamilton Orchestra, as well as contemporary legends like Justin Timberlake, Michael Jackson, Joss Stone, Diana Ross, Earth, Wind and Fire, Jamiroquai, Gladys Knight, Marvin Gaye, The Temptations, The Four Tops, 
rock guitarist Steve Vai, Kirk Franklin, and many more. <laughs> As an orchestrator, his work has been featured on television shows such as American Idol and The Voice. Welcome, Ben Jamin. Hey, everybody. Wow. First thing I want to say is what a great presentation Tracy and Keon did. And also how honored I am to be here. Um, I wanted to talk about resilience. And I feel like, you know, from my perspective, I'm an Afri African-American man in the United States that plays trombone. I mean, who knows more about resilience than me? I mean, come on, you guys, really. So, so let's just talk about uh, resilience. Can I get slide two up, please? So Webster describes resilience as the capacity to quickly, um, the capacity to, 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 to quickly overcome difficulties, toughness. And the second definition is the ability uh, to, the ability to, uh, for a substance or an object to spring back into, into shape. Well, I can just tell you guys that this describes my profession as a musician and my being as an African-American uh, more than you can realize. So uh, slide three, please. So strength and toughness and slide three. Yeah, strength and toughness and flexibility and patience and hope and faith. Uh, those are words that I think define resilience as, as well. There are also words that I use to, to keep myself together in the middle of, of the tough times that we have. Um, but there's always been, that's always been the case with African Americans and musicians, always. Um, slide three, please. Slide four, please, I'm sorry. So from the African American, from the African drums to the Negro spirituals, to the Harlem Renaissance, to the protest songs of the 60s and 70s, to R&B and rap, African, music, African American music has been the cornerstone of our American history. Our music is an essential tool for our resilience and survival. And I want you guys to take some of these things that I'm saying to help you through these hard times that we're having, because we always seem to bounce back. No matter how bad it is, no matter how tough life is, you have to have the resilience and the strength and the spirituality and the faith and everything to, in order to bounce back. And that's what it's about. So I wanna give these positive um, attributes to you and hopefully that you know these things will help you uh, to stay strong in this period in time. So COVID has basically decimated our industry. Um, you know, imagine being in music and not having anyone to play for. Uh, I mean, how, how are you going to survive? What are you going to do? Um, where are we at here? So, so through the, but, but, but with that being said, how would you survive how would we all survive right now if we didn't have uh, music and entertainment through the lockdowns and the quarantines and, and the despair that challenges our everyday uh, in, a, in a new strange world? I mean, I, I imagine Netflix stocks are doing great <laughs> because everyone's at home watching new movies and TVs. Everyone's listening to uh, virtual concerts. So that in itself, the adjustment right there shows resilience that we can continue on, even though this is 
uh, has been such a devastating period of our time. Uh, we have uh, five. There's been so many things that's held us down. But now it looks like things are finally coming around. I know we've got a long, long way to go. And where we'll end up, I don't know. But we won't let nothing hold us back. We're putting our shirts together. We're polishing up our act. And if you've never been held down before, I know you refuse to be held down anymore. I chose that tune to celebrate the resilience that we have. Uh, the lyrics, I want you to send those lyrics. Those lyrics are from a standpoint of, of being held down, being, being for whatever reason. And it speaks to the joy of the resilience that you have and moving forward. That was McFadden and Whitehead's Ain't No Stopping Us Now. It was a song that the black community embraced uh, for their history, but it went to sell. It went on to sell two million copies and was adopted universally by all communities as a tribute of having strength and hold on and abilities to not stop and keep moving forward. This was in a resilient anthem of 1979, and it was so much fun. And it, it applies to where we are now. Uh, slide six, please. Uh, sound. I want to switch the conversation to uh, jazz. So did you guys know that jazz was the only true American art form? Uh, it was born in America. Uh, jazz, the definition of jazz are musicians playing, uh, using improvisation, spontaneous improvisation, uh, which is spontaneous composition in in a, in a band, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, I would say a world at the time uh, that they're on, when they're on stage, they're in their own world and they have to, um, I, they have to listen and they have to adapt and they have to, in that period in time, create on the spot, uh, which is the ideal, uh, way of resilience. I mean, imagine this. Imagine you're in a situation, which we are now, and you have to adapt to what the time is. You have to adapt to what's going on around you. You have to adapt to what's happening. You have to have the strength of your convictions, the strength of your practice, the strength of your faith that you put in enough work to overcome the adversity that's happening. And if you don't, not only will you not succeed, but you hurt those around you, and which would be your band. Your band will crash and burn. Well, I look at that as like the communities that we're in. We have to adapt, we have to change, we have to use our skills of communication, of love, of strength, of everything like that that we have in order to continue, not just for ourselves, but for our world and our community. So that being said, I'd like to move on to slide seven, please. Click the sound icon. Slide 
So this is a tune I wrote called Pray for Peace. And I think that this is one of the things that uh, we need to do in order to um, be resilient. Uh, according to, what's the name of that company? The, uh, according to the Bounce Back Project, uh, resilience is made of uh, five pillars, self-awareness, mindfulness, self-care, positive relationships, and purpose. Um, I would like to focus on self-awareness. Um, self-awareness is identity. Self-awareness is knowing who you are. Uh, from the time I was five years old, I knew I wanted to be a musician, nothing else. Um, it helped me to uh, understand that no matter what I did in life, whether I had to be a uh, parking lot attendant or an accountant or whatever, I still knew in myself who I was, that I was gonna be a musician. I wasn't a parking lot attendant who played music. I was a musician who had to play, who had to be a parking lot attendant in order to continue to, to do music. Uh, so when you have that kind of self-identity, when you have that kind of self-awareness and you know who you are and what you're doing, uh, you continue, there's a, there's a strength inside you that allows you to move forward. Uh, I find it interesting that during slavery, that the first thing that the United States took from the slaves that came in were their identities. Uh, it recognized, they recognized that if, if those people did not have an identity, um, it would lower their self-esteem. It would lower their, um, it would keep them docile. I mean, just imagine, I mean, even as an African-American today, just imagine the fact that you go to a country that does not recognize you as being human, as being a person, uh, as being equal. Uh, and then the country that you came from, they don't recognize you either. I mean, where do you belong? How do you uh, survive? And, and that happened to the African-American community and they had to remain resilient. And one of the ways that helped us through that was music. Uh, can you pull up slide eight, please? Some people say we have a lot of matters. Some say it's a lot of none. Okay. But I say we want to quit moving until we get what we deserve. We've been built. So that was James Brown. <laughs> and we're going to go on with the sound in a minute. But that was James Brown saying, uh, say it loud, I'm black, I'm black and I'm proud. That was a way for African Americans to uh, get their self esteem back. Uh, it gave them what we call now today their swag. And when you have swag, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when you have swag, there's nothing that can hold you back. So I would like for uh, it, just to listen to the lyrics of this song for a minute. Can you hit the sound icon? Some people say we got a lot of malice, some say it's a lot of none. So I want you to notice the difference between Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud uh, from some of the previous songs of the 60s, which were like We Shall Overcome and more of the spiritual hopeful things that were happening during the civil rights uh, period. Uh, James is saying, you know what? We're not, we're not hoping no more. <laughs> we, this, is, this is what we deserve. 
And again, that goes to strength and resilience. It's, it, when you have an inner strength and an inner spirit, uh, you can overcome anything. And uh, that is the African-American perspective. And if I also say musician's perspective, because believe me, as a African-American who plays trombone, plays trombone, you guys, trombone, not, not piano, not bass, I play trombone. And I have been able to make a living. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. When I married my wife, uh, her family, was a little concerned. I'm a little older than her. And, and I told her father, I said, you know, uh, I'm not going to probably be able to give you any grandkids. And I know I'm a little um, older than probably what you expected for your daughter. But no need to worry because I'm stable because I'm I play jazz trombone for a living. And you can imagine. <laughs> you can imagine like great, you know, but but that's what I'm talking about is an inner strength of knowing who you are and what you do. And even with COVID being decimating our industry, uh, there are things that are happening today uh, with the virtual concerts, like we're doing this meeting right here. I mean, you know, six months ago, we wouldn't have been doing this. We've been able to embrace the situation, see what it means, adjust, adapt, stay strong. Uh, in my field, one of the things they're doing are like um, drive-in concerts. Where remember the drive-in theater is where you would go back in the day, I mean, probably most of you are too young to remember drive-in theaters, but now they have concerts there where they, where when you play, they have the screen behind you and people are enjoying, they come in their cars and the sound is pumped in through their radio and they've taken and they've adapted. That's what I'm saying, adapting and having the inner strength and the power. Uh, slide nine, please, without the, thank you. We will continue to borrow from the endurance of the past. We will continue to be strong. We will continue to make music for the future. And even in this trying time, um, we will adapt and that's what resilience is adapting strength power self-identity faith uh, perseverance we will get through this uh, i would like to leave you guys with a arrangement of a tune i did um, by miles uh, Thelonious monk and miles davis main things called round midnight and in this video what you will see are some of the old musicians from the past that blend into the young musicians of the future. And I just hope that this talk will inspire you to stay strong, to continue on. This is just another fight, another hurdle in life. And God bless you all and thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Uh, hit the sound icon, please. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, well, thank you so much for um, sharing your own music with us and for giving us the sounds of resilience. And what I'd like to do now is invite Tracy and Kian and yourself uh, over here. <laughs> <laughs> where is here anymore? We don't know where here is. Um, 
and so that we can, we've, you know, you've laid out these beautiful, different ways of thinking about resilience. And now is an opportunity for us to think together about connections, to find out more about one another's uh, ways of thinking about resilience and um, have a good time. So let's do that. I was wondering if I could kick off with a question for Benjamin, which that was fantastic. I feel so humbled to have been part of this part of this conversation. So thank you. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, it's so clear that for black people, music is a res both a, a, an expression of resilience and maybe even a pathway to resilience because of the social capital that comes with deep embracing of, of black music kind of going to Kian's um, comments about the uh, social capital. Um, I'm wondering to what extent the, the structure of black music, the cadence, the architecture, the improvisation is tied to that resilience. So if I can, if I may just kind of connect it to maybe architecture, there's certain types of structures that will allow something to be resilient. And so I'm wondering if there is a way in which the, 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 the structure, the improvisation, the specifics of the music is a reflection of resilience of black people. That's an excellent question, Tracy. Uh, I would answer that by saying that the years of practice, the years of studying, the years of listening to other artists, other yourself, is like like we're speaking now. There's a language that is spoken, where you can communicate with me, and I can communicate with you. And the more words, and the more um, the more words, and the more grasp of communication, communicative skills that you have, the better your story, the stronger your story stands up. If I can't speak to you, then you get half my message. But, and it's the same in music, we develop our skill and we develop our uh, language uh, in improvisation and in the things that we do. And the more skills that we have in that, lang in that forum, the better our communicative skills, which gives us strength and gives us resilience because we're able to reach out and speak to the audience. We're able to, you know, uh, play something that the audience can uh, feel, that people can feel. And the way that you can reach that is having, uh, the more skills you have, the better you can communicate that. So it all, it all works, you know, just like in your field, uh, what you do, the better you can explain it, the better that you, have this, the more knowledge that you have, the knowledge that you have to explain it and to break it down and to realize what you need to say to a certain person to understand what you're saying. If you don't have those skills, uh, you're lacking. You know what I mean? So yes, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. Thanks for, for asking that. And if I could just jump in, because I'm also thinking, Benjamin, you really talked about this earlier, you know, to improvise is to not know, is to have no fixed direction, um, but at the same time to be profoundly literate in all of your histories, right? And so I would imagine from what you're saying and um, with Tracy's question that improvisation itself is a practice of resilience because there's nothing fixed. True, but the, but the, it's a it's a it's a skill of of um, not knowing, but also knowing uh -huh. if that if that makes sense. So if I hear something because of the amount of work I've put into my craft, I go, oh, that's that, and then I can draw from my draw from my toolbox to instantaneously, you know, communicate to you from
from that from that standpoint. You just can't even when they say imp improv, you're you're drawing from your skills. You're drawing from your toolbox for that particular moment. And the the key is to have as many things in your toolbox <laughs> that you that you can have. So there's never a moment that comes up where you're just going like. I don't have the tools to, to even deal with that. And that does happen sometimes. That's why uh, I believe music is ever growing. You never perfect it. It's always a challenge. So mm. I hope I, that answers the question. I love this, this point that you just made, Benjamin, about not knowing and yet knowing it's almost like you don't come into it fully understanding the path forward, but there are particular structures and approaches through which you and folks that you're playing with have learned over time, either together or possibly even with others. Yeah. And, you know, it really, and, and Tracy, thanks for bringing up this, this, this realm, this question, because it also reminds me about um, what, like folks in, in, in Red Hook and as well in another site that I've, uh, another neighborhood that I've done some research in the, the, lower, the lower East Side in Manhattan, also after Hurricane Sandy. And, you know, these community activists pointing out that the reason they're able to respond is not because they knew what was going to come and, and that they knew, you know, what, specific challenges they would face, but they, they knew how to go about learning and responding to people that they that they that they have that shared language. So the development of a kind of language, you know, allowed them to to know which elderly person to go up to the 12th floor to, to check on when the elevators weren't working. That had never been planned, like they didn't plan that out, but they had developed that kind of shared language around, uh, around their, their, their mutual struggles. Which is, which is the very definition of improvisation, right? There was no plan when Katrina hit. There was no way to understand what's happening. And, and also that's almost the, the, the exact definition of resilience. I mean, you have to adapt, you have to move, you have to take the knowledge that you have and the, the, the history that you have and all the skills that you have to make the right call for the time, which is mm. improvisation and resilience at the same time. You know, you can't just go, oh, Katrina hit, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just not survive the same way we've done with COVID, right? Same way we've done. You know, it's been, this COVID has been tough. It's been really tough on the uh, entertainment business, probably the worst of all the businesses. But I see people doing things like I said, the virtual concerts. Uh, I've seen uh, much more use of the internet now than was before uh, for people to record music and put music out and that kind of thing. Mm. And I'm sure you guys have adjusted, have had to adjust online teaching, right? Mm. Right? And that kind of things where you're not in the classroom anymore and you know, stuff that we're doing like right now. I mean, this is, this is the very definition of, to me, um, resilience and improvisation on the spot. You know, I think, there, I, oh, I'm sorry. I was um, just going to. So Tricia, actually, yeah, go, go for it. No, you go, Rick. You go, Rick. I was just going to take what Kian was saying and what Benjamin was saying about knowing and not knowing and ask you to talk a little bit about how that relates to uh, diversity in science and, the, you know, and what you were talking about earlier about the need for uh, multiple perspectives and for individuals who have known resilience that they bring that at, into their into their practice as scientists? Yeah. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. I think that there's a, you know, there's a nimbleness to be able to respond to what you see and respond to what you uncover, to know and have the confidence to be able to take the next step. And there's the not knowing and being able to be comfortable not knowing, but also have 
you know, the understanding of oneself that says I'm okay not knowing and I can still keep asking questions, keep pushing boundaries. And, and, I, and I do think that in the way we've been talking about um, particular communities who it's sort of in the DNA, it's in the responsiveness, it's in the way you move through the world. It's the same set of tools that really is demanded by science, a comfort with not knowing, a recognition, a, a humility with that, but also the ability to explore within this landscape of uncertainty. And asking good questions, you know, mm -hmm. continuing to come from different places, including the question of like, who's upstairs on that top floor? Yeah, yeah. I think one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the ideas that I just really appreciate that Kian highlighted is the difference between, I mean, the same word resilience is used for this positional kind of the ability to respond to these things that happen externally. And also it's the same word that is this internal cultural capital, this thing that you build within communities of resilience. And I, I, I feel like there's a difference um, but there's the same word and one of them is quite empowering and the other feels more reactive, if that makes sense, one, those, the, the concepts. And I, I'm wondering if, if maybe that, maybe I have, I misinterpreted the way you, you framed it, but I just really caught that and it, it resonated with me. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So you're talking about maybe on the one hand, resilience as an embodied position against like a, a hierarchy or an oppressive structure, mm -hmm. right? So like racism in cities mm -hmm. as like an oppressive structure that has marginalized black and brown communities. And so, you know, it's, it's a kind of like protective structure against that that larger oppressive structure mm -hmm. and on the other hand yeah maybe what what you might be pointing out as a more empowering notion of um, uh, a development of relationships among people who have grown up together who have faced mutual challenges and and it's almost like it's 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 more maybe it sounds more organic possibly, but I think that they're very much related, if not in, in some ways, two sides of the same, same coin, which is that, that the development of social capital, the development of these kinds of um, mutual understandings of the, the kinds of struggles that we have faced over time uh, that those networks and relationships and, and social capital uh, are the kinds of, um, you know, not to, you know, I, I, I hate this overdoing the conflation of physical things and mm -hmm. social things, mm -hmm. but sometimes in some ways that they're related, right? But that that is the kind of social infrastructure that then, you know, can respond when you have a uh, uh, an oppressive system that is, you know, that is, uh, that is pushing, either pushing you or or threatening you, whether whether it is um, like a political or economic challenge or or an environmental one, like a you know like a, a hurricane or or a flood. I thought one of the things that I I saw Kian in your um, presentation, where you were seeing where you um, posted the sign that said uh, "Stop calling me resilient." And, and I, I really understood that uh, message because a lot of times people they like will feel like, well, they'll be okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, how many of us grew up with our parents saying, I worry about your brother or your sister, but I know you're going to be all right. And you're like, no, I need you to worry about me too. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to be, all but here's the thing. And that's one of the reasons why I want to play the James Brown piece because there comes a time that, yes, you use your resilience 
to fight against that very thing. You say like, okay, yes, I'm resilient and I'm demanding, demanding. And I think that's what you're seeing with some of the protests now. And I'm not talking about uh, looting and the rioting, but I'm saying that people are saying like enough, you know, we, this is something we deserve. We're not waiting for you to give it to us, which, you know, if you go back 50 or 60 years, it was more like asking for, asking uh -huh. to be, especially in the minority communities, asking to have not equal rights, civil rights, you know, think about that. You're not asking for, uh, and the civil rights movement was huge and it, and it was a, made a big difference. But it's time now to just, this is supposed to be, and you have been resilient and, you, and not, not to be taken advantage of, but resilient and strong to demand what is due to you, you know? And I think that was one of the reasons, that was, that's why that song, um, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, and you can sub, uh, substitute with black, brown, white, red, yellow whatever you want to whatever you want to say but it has to be to the point that it's like enough we are demanding to have equal opportunity for everybody equal justice for everybody so we can you know that's the only way things so we can move forward you know and uh yeah i thought that was very interesting i really liked what you showed on yeah. that post Thank you. I, I I totally agree. I think like for me that the the protest for Black Lives for racial justice that we see right now is really. I mean, like I I'm like I don't I can't speak at all for the Black experience, but from what I see, that that is a challenge to always having to be resilient. Yes. That at each historical moment among you know african americans in this country you know they have had to be resilient and sometimes it results in amazing uh amazing movements of art right like blue, like you know in 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 urban oops sorry about that that was one <laughs> camera going um in in urban studies and in geography we've been talking a lot about black geographies and specifically what a geographer Clyde, Clyde Woods uh, talks about the, the blues epistemology. And what he's saying is that, you know, that black folks did build a kind of way of knowing through their struggle that, yeah. that we can learn a lot about. And I can see that in the movements that we see today that there is this claim of knowledge claim of of being uh that is part of a long time struggle to say like enough right we're not going to always be that group of people that you can do something else to and i think that you guys the three of you here especially can relate to that being women because <laughs> because we talk about the black struggle and and the minority struggle but women struggle, so it's time, you know what I mean? It's time, I mean, look at, I've got three very intelligent, you know, beautiful women on the screen that are positive and have so much to give to society. And, and, and so um, I think if you think about that struggle with you guys as well, it can help mm -hmm. you to understand uh, the struggle of, of minorities in, as well. On that note, on the idea of beauty, um, I hate to leave this conversation, but there's more to do um, here. Um, so what I'd like to suggest is that we're going to take a little break. Um, for the next 12 minutes or so, I invite all of us to consider what we've heard this evening and um, students, you know what you do now. You're going to go to your small group discussion rooms. And if you don't have the link, it's posted in the chat. I invite you to head there now and we'll look forward to your questions uh, when you return. 
To our other guests, community members, friends, faculty, and colleagues, we invite you to stay put right where you are because you're in for another treat. It brings me great pleasure to again share the screen with my colleague, Kevin Kane, the director of our Visual and Performing Arts Education Program, an academic minor in our school and an extraordinary connector to Los Angeles schools. Kevin's going to provide a little background about a special partnership with 11th and 12th grade students from Venice High School. And I'll see you later. Kevin, welcome, the screen is yours. Uh, thanks, Vic, and good evening, everyone. Um, wonderful to be back here with you all again. And yes, uh, personally feeling noticeably more resilient uh, in my body and in my soul than last week. Uh, but as <laughs> playwright Tony Kushner wrote, um, the great work begins. Um, as Vic just mentioned, I'm Kevin Kane, the director of the UCLA Visual and Performing Arts Education Program, uh, otherwise known as VAPA. Um, for those joining for the first time, I'm pleased to introduce you to VAPA's very special partnership with 10 Questions program this year. To expand 10 Questions and to reach deeper into the community, we've invited middle and high school students from five local Los Angeles public schools to engage in the class. Each cohort of students have been invited to um, have their own classroom conversations and create art in response to one of the questions, um, one of the 10 questions. We share their work with the faculty panelists who are responding to that question and with the UCLA students who are enrolled in the course. And we also share this extraordinary work with you, the public. Um, we've had the opportunity to see visual arts students from the UCLA Community School respond to the question, what is justice? We've seen theater students from the LA County High School for the Arts interpret what is power. If you were with us last week, you had the chance to see the beautifully realized choreographic works that the seventh and eighth grade dance students from Marina Del Rey Middle School created in response to the question, what is hope? And tonight it brings me great pleasure to share photographic works created by 11th and 12th grade students from Venice High School in response to tonight's question, what is resilience? So in their works, the Venice High School students attempted to connect resiliency with time. And they used photography, perhaps the most democratic of all art forms, especially these days, to illustrate the passage of time. The passing of a second, a minute, a day, a week, a month, or the passing of four years. With this concept in mind, most students contributed three photographs or a triptych as a photo narrative. As you move through the photographs, the idea is to showcase time passing by, a reminder of life moving forward, which contributes to and builds resilience, albeit in complex and unique ways. Um, with that said, the students interpreted this complicated question of resilience in their own way, as described in their artist statements. Disparate definitions of resilience and portrayals of what inspired how these moments and people are extraordinarily excited to welcome these students in tonight's webinar and congratulate them for artistry and dedication to this assignment. They are actually in the webinar right now. So hello, Venice High School, and thank you. Um, their teacher, Miss Ruth Green, uh, English teacher and a chair of the Venice High School Media Arts Magnet and a wonderful partner to the VAPA program is also in attendance tonight. Um, Ms. Green shares that resilience for her is, quote, not just making it through the day during this time of crisis, but making sure to incorporate opportunities for creativity and self-reflection. And though her main responsibility is to provide instruction in reading and writing, this partnership has enabled Ms. Green to ensure that her students enter the realm of creativity and self-exploration on their path to resiliency. I also wanna make sure I give a shout out to two of the finest teaching artists, Aya Fatala and Ago Visconti, both in this room tonight, who have been working with this cohort of Venice School students from the beginning of the fall semester. Um, 
Ms. Green regularly welcomes Aya and Algo into her virtual classroom to infuse media arts, design, and photography into the curriculum. FYI, both Aya and Algo are recent alums of the School of the Arts and Architecture, both graduated with majors in arts, uh, sorry, major majors in art and minoring in arts education through the VAPA program. And in fact, Ago herself was a student in the 10 questions class just last fall. So a wonderful continuity building from this class to VAPA's network of schools and local youth artists. Thank you so much, Ago and I am. Without further delay, what is resilience as interpreted by Venice High School? I hope you enjoy what they've created.
Ah, oh, thank you. These amazing students shared their work and their their perspectives with us, um, letting us see through their eyes what resilience means. Um, great job, Venice High School. I want to thank their teachers, Ms. Green, Aya, and Ago. It's an honor and a privilege to work with teachers that are so dedicated to their students. Also, a mention of gratitude to our VAPA program coordinator, Raimundo Baltasar for all his hard work in coordinating this collaboration with Venice High School. Thanks so much, Raimundo. Um, plus, not sure if he's in the room tonight, but we're so grateful for the hard work and creativity of VAPA designer, Brian P, for editing tonight's video collage, as well as all the ones that came before this one. You've all done a beautiful work. For those wanting to learn more or to dive deeper into this work and the work we do at VAPA, visit vapa.ucla.edu or Instagram, um, follow us at Instagram at U-C-L-A-V-A-P-A-E. Our next and final school collaboration will pre be presented on Monday, November 30th, when music students from John Marshall High School share their response to the question, what is love? I hope you will tune in then as well. I think we might have a few minutes left before our host and panelist and the 10 question students return and take some more questions from the audience. We hope you'll stick around and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks again, Venice High School, fantastic. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed the work you saw during our break. Um, we have a number of excellent questions that have begun populating our chat and that students have brought back from the breakout rooms. So I think we have everybody here and I, Look forward to posing some questions to our panelists. Um, so first question, um, is there a danger in being resilient? I I'm glad it made you laugh, Kian. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think there's a danger in being resilient but I think there's a danger in expecting only some people to be resilient because other folks don't have to. Great. Um, how do we know if something no longer has resilience or would a living organism always have resilience? Are you posing that to anybody? I'm posing it to everybody. Okay. I believe that a living organism, organism has the ability to be resilient. Uh, like we all have the ability to do anything, but that organism has to develop the tools and the, um, the things that will make them resilient. You come into this world uh, no, with no knowledge, but it's up to you to to do the things that will allow you to be uh, resilient. Tracy, yeah, there, does that sound? Yeah, I think I I really like that answer. There, for from a slightly different perspective, if it is possible for an uh, there's a there's what is kind of the opposite of resilient uh, uh, resilience fragility you know when does something become fragile when the pressure on that thing becomes too much when the pressure on a body causes the body to break so there's a lot built into the mm -hmm. body that imp that infuses resilience but there is a breaking point and i think understanding what those breaking points are whether it's in the environment or if it's in the cell, or if it's in the body, um, is really crucial. Or societies, or democracies. So um, here's another interesting question, um, putting together the two different um, presentations. How would Tracy Johnson's framework of redundancy, adaptation, and dynamism apply to Kiango's urban resiliency work. 
I think that is an excellent question. And honestly, I think that that is the answer to that. I, I hope Tracy and I will be talking about way past this particular session. Like, I think it is, it is so, it just makes me think so much. One of the things that I think might be relevant, and I was thinking about this as Tracy was presenting earlier, is this relationship between uh, between social systems and biological systems, and to what extent we can we can make or force a relationship between them. So you know, when I th talk about resilience. Uh, and particularly a, a more just re resilience. I'm talking about power relationships in societies that are socially constructed. And, you know, I'm sure I could find a parallel in the biological and ecological world of power, some aspect of power, but I don't think that the social construction of it the way that we hold different views about different people carries through to a biological realm. And I think maybe that is some of the, the possible distinctions uh, between the, 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 the different ways of seeing it. I do think that the redundancy though, which is a core, core mm. component of resilience, you know, if, just to be very specific about it, you know, you can see ways in which redundancies are built into structures to allow them to be resilient. Um, you know, rather it's living in California and earthquake protections, you know, so there are ways in which structures can, and, 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 and the ability to a structure or a system to adapt, you know, that I think those, there are some of those concepts that, that, that can flow between the disciplines. Yeah, that's true. And, and it does make me think that oftentimes when people talk about, you know, cities or people in places being resilient, they do talk about things like being adaptive and having redundancy. So when one system fails, something else picks it up, that you don't put everything into one particular infrastructural system or count only on one method of delivering aid, for instance. So um, I think this follows on what you were just talking about. Um, so another question has come in. How can the adaptation of urban planning help improve resilience in urban spaces? So I think a lot of cities are thinking about this right now. And broadly speaking, I think there have been two approaches. So on the one hand, Many cities are trying a kind of um, hard physical adaptive structure. So, you know, when we, we know we'll confront stronger storms and sea level rise, so let's put up a bigger and better seawall, like in New Orleans. Let's put up a bigger and better seawall uh, to adapt to what is bound to be more challenging situations in the future. So, that's one way where, where, uh, adaptation of a city is responding to that. I think the other way is a more, you know, one could say dynamic and uh, at least a, a, more, a more dynamic and possibly more aligned with the ecological sciences part of things, which is um, less counting on maybe one physical adaptive strategy, but to make sure that the, the relationships among uh, our infrastructures and our communities and our social institutions are tightly knit enough so that when something fails somewhere, you know, we're able to adapt and do something else. And a lot of things have been said about the importance of libraries in the last few years. When we have social and public institutions like libraries that cater to all of us, and that we know to access, that it, those are points through which people can, can collect and gather and, and in some ways respond to things that may come up. So it's a much more in some ways like organic and malleable kind of adaptation 
uh, rather than a more physical one. Here is the last question, formal question of the evening. Um, it's a great question. Would you argue that people are inherently born with resilience or that people are nurtured to be resilient? And or do experiences, the more resilience you, um, do you become more resilient by going through experiences where you're required to be resilient? That is a very, very hot question. You know, from a strictly disease perspective, there are particular diseases where there is a mutation and for all intents and purposes, the person should have certain disease manifestations, but there's something else in the biology that is, that is, um, that is providing a level of res resilience. And there's lots of people who are trying to understand what those are. So there is, there, there, there can be intrinsic biological features that contribute to resilience, but I don't think that's what you mean in terms of are there people who have the ability to adapt to environments and situations better than other people, there is a possibility that there might actually be a biological component to that. I think that there are folks who wonder if there are genetic and biochemical pathways that may be influencing intrinsic resilience, but it's certainly not by itself. There's certainly other components that overlay on top of that, but I think it's a cool question. Hmm. I would agree with that. I think this aligns with a lot of debates right now about, you know, like whether one is born with it or whether, whether it's our environment or, or our culture that, that shapes it. I mean, I think, you know, like I've, uh, I've done a lot of work with LGBTQ activists for whom, you know, that is like a word that's often or a concept that's, that's often lodged at them, like, oh, are you born with this? Or did this somehow happen? And there's a lot of, you know, in that case, there's a lot of pushback to, to the notion that, that one is not born queer. But in some ways, I don't know if that is the key question to define one or the other, but to, to think about, I think as Tracy was saying, part of it possibly being biological, possibly being psychological, born with it, but that no matter what, we're still counting on cre on understanding and nurturing uh, cultures and environments to help us do one thing or the other better anyway. Thank you. I'm afraid we're just about out of time. So I want to ask Benjamin and each of you, if you have like a last word or comment or anything that would um, just feel like it puts a little closure on a topic we're not going to be done speaking about. Uh, real quick, I would just say that along with the science of being resilient, you have to remember that uh, and you may or may not believe, but I believe that we're spiritual beings and that part of your spirit there's a different kind of energy that happens there. And if you can tap into that, along with the science, along with the tools that you have from your uh, brain and from your, your learning, that you will quick, quickly learn to be resilient and strong. It's the inner strength thing that I think is the, the strongest part of resilience, the having an inner strength and you get that through your spirituality. So, uh, and I'm not talking religion, I'm talking spirituality. Uh, so that would be my closing statement. I wanna thank you guys for having me. It was really a, really a blast being here. Thank you. I love that, I love that. And I, and I, one of the things that I found so powerful about this discussion is this sense of resilience coming from within, re resilience being um, a part of a, a community capital that it's it's very much about building from you know the heart and the soul and less about reacting to this to the stuff that comes at you it's more about what what you're bringing that allows you to navigate whatever the world is and i just thought that both of you in discussion of music and discussion of communities and architecture um i think really beautifully illustrated that so thank you
Yeah, I, 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 I agree so much with what's just been said. I just feel so lucky to have to, to be able to take part in conversations like this. And really what, what this evening has um, really reaffirmed for me is how important it is to, to, to be aware of different ways to know things like from the biological and ecological and from the experiential and cultural historical end of things to experience things differently through the body, through music, that, you know, we might be contained in what we do on a daily basis. But, you know, events like this really like just stress to me that it's not all about that. It's about different points of view and different experiences. Definitely. Excellent. You're here. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for being here with us tonight and for this consideration of resilience. A big thanks to our special guests. What a great program this was. Um, so this concludes our program and we hope you'll join us again next week for what is humor as we uh -huh. move into the challenging seventh week of quarter and we find some time for laughter. <laughs> Same time, new link. And to learn more about the entire series or to RSVP, visit arts.ucla.edu slash 10 questions. So for anyone wishing to continue the conversation, you're invited to stick around for an informal post-show chat with our guests. Should you choose to stay, we ask that you turn your cameras on and use the Zoom raise hand feature found in the participants window to indicate that you'd like to join us. Thank you. And until next week, good night.